Yes, how great thou art. I hope you felt that. I hope you felt the spirit of that. We are now going to our reading of today. We are finding ourselves a couple of Sundays in the first book of the Bible in the Old Testament, Genesis. And today we are there again. We are in Genesis 29, verses 15 through 28. You can either follow along with me or you can simply take the privilege of listening. When Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you for seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. And he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpha to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah, and Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme this morning, good trouble, good trouble. I'm not really legitimately a sports fan, but I have real potential to be a sports fan. Every so many years, someone blesses me with a pair of free tickets and I go off to see some sports group in Chicago and I can really get into it. I can really scream and shout and I can do that whole nine yards thing and you would think I was some loyal, faithful, patriotic supporter of a team. A couple of years ago, someone gave me tickets, premium tickets to go see the White Sox. Now, there's a lot of things to like about baseball, the beauty of the field, the hot dogs, but what I'm really intrigued with is the relationship between the pitcher, the batter, and the ball. Because that is what sets everything in motion. Without that relationship, there wouldn't be really baseball. The batter, the person that comes up to home plate, that person's objective is to hit the ball, to really hit the ball. And so in the game of baseball, I've observed that there are a few rules around hitting the ball. If the batter swings at the ball, no matter whether the ball was out of range or not, it is considered a strike. But if the batter does not swing the ball, it has to be within a certain strike zone to be considered a strike. But if the pitcher throws a ball and it's outside of the strike zone, and the batter does not swing. It is a ball. If the pitcher pitches four balls, he can actually walk a batter to first base. And so it's pivotal 
that the batter knows when to swing as well as when not to swing. And herein lies what I want to talk a little bit with you all today about, knowing when to swing. Let me first say I think that we have a swinging problem in America. I'm trying to resist talking about number 45, but he's, he's such a good example of humans who swing regardless of what kind of ball is thrown, they just swing. His predisposition is to swing, but he's really not alone. You all don't get off that easily this morning. Sometimes when we are under pressure and we feel stressed out, we are more prone to swing. Now let me raise my hand. That has happened to me a few times. When people are afraid, when people are feeling like they've got their backs really pressured, people are more apt to swing. Police officers with their stressful jobs and maybe even a few stereotypes and a faulty system on the streets swing. And some of us looking over our shoulders and around the corner who live in a hypervigilant world often just swing because we want to beat others before they swing on us. Kids are growing up not knowing how to resolve conflict and swinging with real guns. And just this past week, a, gray, a gang drove by a funeral. Actually, two funerals were happening. And just let it rip swinging. And after they had swung, 14 more people were dead. When people say things to us sometimes, sometimes instead of pausing and praying, we just swing back. We're out here swinging, not even paying attention to the ball. And sometimes we not only harm others, but we harm ourselves. We swing our bigotry around. We swing our fear around. We swing our words around. We swing our pain around. We swing our guns around. We swing our titles around. We swing our power around. We got a swinging problem in America. In the biblical text today, there's a real opportunity for Jacob to swing. Yes, here he is, the same Jacob that two Sundays ago swindled his brother out of his birthright because he was hungry. And since then, he swindled him out of the blessing that the father was supposed to give to the oldest son. And so his dad instructs him, Jacob, you got to go. You are upsetting the family dynamics. His brother is upset. His dad is now deceased and his mama can't protect him. Go find your uncle Laban and let him give you one of his daughters, but you got to get up out of here. And so Jacob takes off. He finds his uncle, but before he even sees his uncle, he sees sunshine on a rainy day diva and he can't stop looking at him. The text says he runs up and kisses her and weeps. And the discovery hits him that his cousin is beautiful. She takes him to meet his uncle Laban. He's so proud to see his nephew. He's so glad to have another male to be able to work closely beside him. He's a good worker and so his uncle says after a couple of weeks, hey, you can't just continue to work for me for free. What can I do for you, nephew? He looks around and says, Rachel, give me Rachel. And the uncle says, no problem, better you than some other man I don't know. Work for me seven years and she's yours. And so seven years is no problem because he's got an image of sunshine on a rainy day, eye candy diva. And if anyone's asking what can make him feel so good, it's Rachel. When he has worked for his uncle for seven years, he goes to him, he says, deal done, where is Rachel? And I love these words verbatim, give me my wife that I may go into her. For any of you all needing a little bit of romance or needing a little bit of romantic language, Give me so that I might go in. 
So there's a feast and there's lots of food and there's people that work for the family. And this anticipation is growing inside of Jacob that he's about to be with this beautiful woman, Rachel. But when the events wane, his uncle brings him his oldest daughter, Leah. The text tells us that Leah is not beautiful. I mean, she got lovely eyes, but she's not beautiful. Now they do say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I've been on a puppy hunt. And please, I'm not comparing Rachel and Leah to dogs. Please don't take it that way. But I've been on a puppy hunt. And I've discovered something about my own preferences. Maybe you already know what your preferences are. I discovered I like dogs with a lot of hair. I prefer small dogs with hair, but clearly thick, hairy dogs are a winner in my book. I have looked at a lot of puppies and dogs, and I, more, I know more than I've ever wanted to know about puppies and dogs and costs and taking care of them. And well, let's just say I didn't realize that other people had the same sentiments and that the sale of dogs has gone up over 200% in the last six months and during COVID, and it seems like everybody has a similar idea. I thought I was a little bit more original than that. But it seems like I'm the average person, Janella, and I'm doing pretty much what everybody else in the world is doing, getting a dog for partnership and for some companionship around the house and for a child maybe even. So a month ago, some well-meaning friends found a dog that was in need of a home and sent me a picture of a chihuahua. Now I have to proceed very carefully here because I don't want to offend any Chihuahua lovers that are looking at me on Facebook Live right now. I don't know how to say it without being offensive, so I'm just going to ask you all to use your sanctified imagination. But let's just say a Chihuahua is not small, it's tiny. And let's just say it's not hairy, it's bald. And let's just say if you roll over on a chihuahua, you might kill it. And let's just say when you look at this dog, when I looked at this dog that they had sent me with their well-meaning hearts, I had two thoughts, and one of them I can't express right now. But the second was, how am I going to get myself out of this situation? I did say yes with my mouth, but I was still thinking, how am I going to get myself out of this situation? Well, thank the Jesus, God was looking down on me. I noticed that there are a lot of people that love chihuahuas, and my friend is one of them, and my son loves Deerfield, and it's great to go visit the chihuahua. So I've learned a lot about myself, and I've learned a lot about my preferences, and it appears after two months of looking, I've come clearly down to a few dogs that I really, really like. So Jacob had been waiting for seven years or some period of time, and he had worked, and he had worked, and he had worked, and he knew what he liked. He knew his preference. He was smitten with Rachel. Are you all following me? There was an attraction, there was a chemistry, and there was a preference. Now come on, some of y'all like short, some of you like tall, some of you like wide, some of you like thin. Come on, we have preferences. It's just like spaghetti sauce. Some like it sweet, some like it spicy, some like it thick, some like it chunky. We have preferences and we know what we want. And there's nothing wrong with Leah and her lovely eyes. But Rachel was it for Jacob. She was the picture he had been carrying in his mind for seven years. And so after the party when daddy brings Leah, was the opportune time to swing. Jacob had been swindled, and some might say it was karma, but nonetheless, he had to deal with a Uncle Laban. Jacob got played. Many of us know what that feeling is like and realize when you've been swindled. And so what should he do? Should he swing? Maybe it'd give him a little bit of peace of mind, but it wouldn't give him Rachel. This is daytime and nighttime drama rolled up into one, the progeny of Abraham. And so now Jacob has a choice. He has already worked seven years for Rachel and he got himself Leah. And at this point he can't walk away or he could walk away, but then he'd have Leah and he wouldn't have Rachel. 
He can take Leah and go on about his business. He can fight for Rachel and lose. He can swing. And now that's the time to ponder, to hold in suspense. Now, what would Jesus do? But we already know what Jesus would do. What is Jacob going to do? And it's right here. I can hear Kenny Rogers' famous lyrics. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and know when to run. And that's the thing not all of us know. See, because too many of us are swinging when maybe we should fold them, maybe we should hold them, maybe we should run away. Swinging sometimes is not the best move, it's not the best tactic. So what is, what is Jacob going to do? What is Jacob going to do? Jacob has just gotten beaten at his own game. The game he played so often on his brother Esau now is the game that's got played on him. So the trickster gets tricked. But Jacob still had a vision, and we talked about that two weeks ago, how Jacob, no matter how bad he was, he had a vision, and he could always keep his vision within periphery. So no matter how much he got distracted, no matter how many curveballs were thrown at him, he knew not to swing because he knew what he wanted. And so Jacob, this guy that's already worked seven years for Leah, now works seven years more. He doesn't get distracted. He doesn't swing. The uncle does not honor his words. And because the uncle does not honor his words, three people are impacted, Leah, Rachel, and Jacob. Everything we do in life impacts somebody else. That's why you should wear your mask because it ain't just about you. That's why you should socially distance, because it ain't just about you. That's why you should wash your hands, because it ain't just about you. So anyway, Jacob decides to work for seven more years. The uncle pulls a move that in Chicago might have gotten him killed, and we know what it, that is serious business over here in Chicago. And so he works because he wants Rachel. Our desires for justice and mercy and grace have to run as deep as Jacob's desires for Rachel. So what is the real meaning of the message today? Is the message don't swing? No, not exactly. The meaning of the message today is knowing when to swing. There are many times when we shouldn't swing and the Holy Spirit is there to help us out. We are still in Pentecost. But no, the point of the message is not to never swing. It's knowing when to swing. July 17th, John Lewis, rest in peace, died. He was a real soldier, a real activist. He was molded and shaped by his love and instruction in Troy, Alabama. He loved his mom, and his mom would tell him, John, boy, don't you get in trouble. He remembered this. When he was a kid, when he would leave out, his mom would say, son, don't get in trouble. In other words, John, don't swing. He lived in a segregated community, and it would be years before he would even meet his first white person. That's how segregated the community was he grew up in. And so later, as he grew older, he visited an uncle in New York, and he began to be exposed to even more. And at 17, he had the awesome experience of meeting Rosa Parks. And then at 18, at the request of Martin Luther King, he was exposed even more to that man. And then John realized something. He had to get in trouble. He had to take the swing. He recalls when he marched across the bridge in Selma, he never realized they would use physical force. And when they began to beat him with sticks, he thought he was going to die. John Lewis has gotten arrested over 40 times because he got in trouble. And John realized early on that some trouble is not only good trouble, but it is necessary trouble. Representative John Lewis in the same age bracket as many of you listening to me was still working and still making trouble at 80 years old. He concluded he might even need to go to jail a few more times 
just to make necessary and good trouble. In 2016, in the spirit of swinging the bat and making trouble, he let us sit down in the House of Representatives to address the need for gun control in this country. They were looking for votes to expand background checks and ban gun sale usage and people flying under a no-fly watch list. But the NRA is powerful in this country, and even with the sit-down, the vote didn't pass. And we are seeing the results of the vote not passing. The point of today's message is knowing when to swing. And when that happens in baseball, the fans are happy. When someone knows when to swing and hit the ball, the fans erupt. It is time for us to swing the bat. Our present climate and culture necessitates that we swing. In 2007, Siong Cho walked on VCU, Virginia Tech campus. I'm sorry, not VCU. Walked on Virginia Tech campus. And that day when he walked off, there would be 32 people dead. Cho killed 27 students and five faculty and the next morning killed two people in his apartment complex. How did he get the guns? He got one from out of state dealer, but he got one right across the street from a pawn shop. Professor Nikki Giovanni said when she saw the news on TV, she instantly knew who the student was. This student had been in her class and after a couple of weeks, she went to administration and said, you must remove him from my class. They gave her a little bit of pushback, and then she said, you either remove him or you remove me. But one of us is going. And they took that child out of her class. She said as she watched the news, she knew beyond a shadow of a doubt who the kid was. She had already alerted administration, so administration knew There are troubled people all over our world besides Kanye West. There are troubled people not just mentally but ideologically and spiritually and emotionally. There are people in our country that have been taught hate masqueraded as the gospel of truth. And it's time for the people of God and the people with love in their hearts to get to home plate and swing. It is time for us to make trouble in our protests. It's time for us to make trouble by calling out elected officials near and far and telling them what is important to us. It's time for us to make necessary trouble by supporting bills that support gun law reform, police reform, and mental health reform. It is important for us to make trouble, insisting that right now is the time for us to focus on humans and not our economy. Because without humans, there is no economy. If Jesus could flip for one sheep, then we can flip for 1%. Abraham Lincoln said, I am bound not to win, but I am bound to be true. I'm not bound to succeed, but I'm bound to live up to the light that is in me. It is time for us to live up to the light that is in us and make necessary trouble by stepping up to the back and living what we believe publicly. Martin Luther King Jr. said a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Now is the time for us to swing and shine our light and get in as much good and necessary trouble as we can. John Lewis was 80 years old, just in case you want to bring up your age this morning. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, got in plenty of trouble, and he got arrested too. It is time, and it has been time, and it is definitely time now for us to make good trouble, even when our mamas and our Bibles and our beliefs and our leaders tell us not to get in trouble, tell us not to take the knee. It is time, and it has been time, for us to get in good and necessary trouble. It's time for us to get so disturbed by the killings in Chicago, by what is happening in our country, that we can no longer be polite and nice and cordial and sit in our comfortable homes or sit on the sidelines. 
it is time for us to make necessary trouble. It is time for us to swing. Amen.